as mentioned previously, we have covered Leopoldo Lugones on the podcast before in our episode on spiritualism. Lugones was born on June 13, 1874, and died on February 18, 1938, and was a prolific modernist author of short stories and poetry. Borges, while initially critical of his work, eventually referred to him as the greatest writer of Argentina. Lugones was a supporter of the 1930 Argentine coup, which was instigated by General José Félix Uriburu, who was supported by the nationalist and with the unfolding of the political situation not in his favor, Lugones committed suicide by taking a mixture of whiskey and cyanide. Ouch. Lugones was also a theosophist, the movement founded by Helena Blavatsky, and still quite active today. And in his stories, he was very much interested in pursuing the line between the spiritual and the scientific. We covered two of his stories previously in episode 12, where we took a closer look at the spiritualist movement and its influence on literature. And while I think those two stories emphasize the spiritualist nature a little more than this one, the occult is certainly present in the background here. In Angel Flores' seminal 1955 paper, Magical Realism in Spanish-American Fiction, he cites Lucones' quote, truly fabulous narratives of strange forces as being an early precursor to magical realism. Magical realism he defines as starting with the Borges 1935 collection, a universal history of infamy, though pretty much every magical realism scholar since would put the starting point a little bit later than that. However, Flores in turn identifies Poe as a major influence on Lugonis, which I think is pretty clear from these yeah. stories. In Rachel Haywood Ferreira's mm -hmm. The Emergence of Latin American Science Fiction, she expresses frustration that a lot of science fiction works from Latin America are classified as magical realism just because they are from South America. And I think it's yes. a point pretty well taken. And while certainly the story is much more science fiction than it is magical realism, it's probably true that due to its influence on the genre's later forms that this is probably the closest we'll come to covering Latin American magical realism on the podcast, but who knows where the episodes will take us in the future. Yeah, and it's pretty f horrible that nobody's translated these before. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. like the two stories we read previously, tonight's story, The Omega Force, is also from Strange Forces, which is a short story collection published in 1906. At the time we did the spiritualist episode, about a year or so ago of it, there weren't any translations of it that I could easily find, so I translated all three of the stories and posted them on our blog spot. Since then, a another translation has come out from what I believe is an independent press, but it's just really puzzling how little known Lugonis is in the English-speaking world. He's a really interesting writer, and these are good stories that have a really cool atmosphere and ideas in them. Yeah. Regarding the translation, it should be noted that Lugonis was a very difficult author for me to work with, as a lot of the phrasing that he uses in Spanish just doesn't parse well in English when translated literally or trying to keep any kind of meter or... With a language like Spanish that's closer to English than a language like Russian, it's a lot more tempting to use exact translations because a lot of the words are the same in English as they are in Spanish, but they might not flow as well in a sentence when it's all put together. And as an amateur translator, there's obviously going to be some limits of the translation, but I hope that at least we've been able to produce something readable so at least more people can get into this kind of stuff because I, I think it's really worth checking out. As we are a spoiler podcast, and this is a very short story, we, of course, encourage you to read the story before listening to the plot summary, which will be starting quite shortly. So, the story starts out with our three characters of the narrative together, who are the narrator, his friend, a medical student who decided to forego his exams for developing interest in philosophy, and this mysterious, eccentric inventor who, to earn money for his basic survival, he develops these industrial machines and appliances, but his interest isn't really in making money off of any kind of engineering prowess, but rather in something deeper. The inventor is prone to theorizing about the occult, the mind and the cosmos, and their place 
in how everything works. And he's gathered the narrator and the doctor philosopher together to reveal an astonishing secret he discovered. The mechanical power of sound. The inventor says the concept isn't difficult to understand. Just picture how the low notes from a cathedral's organ can physically shake you. And through some really great fantasy physics and name-checking various scientists and mathematicians who've done work in acoustics, something that Lugonis really loves doing, the inventor reveals his device to his two friends. The device is built on principles demonstrated in Koenig's sirens and contains some tuning forks and wires, which generate a series of waves, which when combined with one another, shoot out of the microphone horn like an ethereal projectile. The inventor says, quote, if the wave goes to the molecular center of the body, it disintegrates into impalpable particles, and he provides them with a demonstration, blowing up a wheel he has lying around the garage. The narrator and the doctor philosopher give it a shot, but they can't work it at all, and it seems like only the inventor can, like it's some sort of marksman skill that he has. The inventor realizes its horrible capabilities as a potential weapon, and he's a pacifist, and he's horrified by the thought of it being used even on an animal as some form of testing. Over the next few weeks, the narrator and the doctor philosopher are shown incredible wonders with the machine, and the narrator thinks there's this one notable incident that the inventor remarked on a disintegrated glass of water, where the water was physically pushed through the glass molecules, as a few days later they find the inventor in a similar condition. One day they find the inventor slumped dead in his chair with his brains blown out through the back of his skull all over the walls. Yeah, it's the kind of gross imagery that we were definitely missing from uh, The Fortune. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like... Yeah. Really <laughs> descriptive. And the guy even tastes it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Oh, his brain... Oh, no, he smells... He doesn't... He might not taste it, but he smells it. He definitely sticks his finger in it, and it's like this, like, thick, buttery substance, and yeah. And he's like, oh, that's brain matter. Yeah. <laughs> he just knows. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a doctor, so presumably this is not his first right. time sticking his finger in some brains. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want my doctor sticking his finger in my brain. Well, unless he's a brain surgeon. Yeah, that's that's the case. <laughs> but, yeah, total Edgar Allan Poe great horror moment. It's not clear if this was accidental or suicidal on the inventor's part. But with him also dies the secret of its operation. And Institute men, Lutz and Schultz, can't make any progress with it. And and they're trying. Yeah, they're, they're they definitely trying. A, yeah. yeah, I'm sure they want to make a weapon out of yeah, it, right? right. Mm -hmm. And the story is brief, and that's the end of it right there. But in its short time, I think it raises a lot of issues that it almost touches upon in a single sentence, sometimes with just a couple words. But something that is refreshing to see in these kind of stories where it just really takes on the ethical issues of what would happen if we were to develop a weapon that would be so powerful, it'd be such a game changer in warfare, that its use would just be so horrible that its inventor literally blows his brains out over it. And I, mean, I, yeah. I tend to think that he almost did it intentionally to prevent right, I was its just gonna say, spread through so the I, world. Yeah. At first I thought it was accidental because I almost thought like because it works with his brain like maybe he just has to think something and it happens and I I couldn't help but think of the Star Trek episode where they're on the planet where whatever they think of is manifest yeah. in, in physical reality. Right. Yeah, surely. And I thought like oh he was experimenting with his machine and he just thought to himself what, what if what would happen if as in the case of that glass of water, and just as he was thinking it, it happened, right? Yeah. But then I started to think as you did, and I think, yeah, I think it is purposeful. <laughs> and I don't know, this kind of gives the story an extra layer of sadness, I think. Because, yeah, like, he did seem to be worried about it. He didn't seem to be worried about how it would be used, right? Yeah, really legitimately touched. <laughs> and for, one thing about Lugonis that Ferreira notes is that he really does enjoy this formula of an eccentric scientist finding some big secret about how the universe works that's beyond contemporary science, and maybe it has to do with the yeah. occult. And it always ends poorly for the discoverer. It's almost cosmic horror. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the other two stories we read were, were similar in that sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's 10 stories in total in Strange Forces. I'm not sure if they all are along the same lines, but I get the sense that a lot of them are. And I would really like to see a penguin or, you know, a professional literature translation group really have a go at releasing a definitive anthology of Lugonis' stuff with notes and commentary and all that stuff, because I think he's one writer that really does deserve it. Did he write other short stories besides those initial the ones in Strange Forces? He's written quite a bit, yeah. I don't have a complete bibliography in front of me, but he seems to have been quite prolific, especially in poetry. Right. Yeah, I was mostly wondering about fiction and where he went with that, because these stories are so interesting. They're really, yeah, they're really short. They're really about a weird discovery about the universe and ethics, like especially this one, and also an atmosphere that is, I mean, I can tell that these stories were hard to translate. We talked about this before, and I know you did, you did a really good job, but I did have a little trouble originally. Because maybe the translation was, you know, the instinct was to go very literal, yeah. right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I was sort of struggling with it a little bit, even though it was short. And, and then I just kind of thought to myself, oh, I, I have to reread. I mean, I always know when, when there's a, a little bit of a struggle when I have to reread sentences. And I've pointed that out on the podcast before. It did happen with, you know, something like Arctic as well, where I just kind of couldn't really figure out what was actually being said. And I didn't quite think it was me. But I don't know. I mean, can you talk to us a little bit more about the translation process, maybe? If you can think of any specific examples that come up off the top of your head. So, yeah. No, this is a good example of translation difficulty. The second sentence in particular, I spent so much time going over it, trying to choose exactly what wording to use. I had, I, I remember questioning that sentence too. Yeah. I must have reread that one a number of times. I like a hook at the beginning of a story yeah. too. Like that, I'm a person that's drawn to the beginning of things and I, right. the beginning is what gets me, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. Yeah. So the, the first sentence is more or less fine. We were but three friends. But the second sentence is where it gets tricky. So for the second sentence, I translated it as two of us, and just just this two of us clause here in Spanish is written los dos. So it mean the two, which just does not parse in English as being two people. Well, it might, but certainly not from the narrator's perspective. Right, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> like, los dos de la confidencia, you know, the, the two in the confidence. Translated literally into English, it just doesn't work. So I had to go with the two of us, which breaks a more literal translation. It's just little things like that, the way he phrases it, that work in Spanish, but wouldn't work in English if he were to translate it directly or more literally. Yeah. Likewise, he uses a lot of idioms and phrases that are hard to translate. Some of his other stories, I think more so than this one, an inexplicable phenomenon, there was a couple idioms that I really spent a lot of time trying to chase down what they actually mean, because even <laughs> looking at the translation, hmm. I was like, wait, what, what? And you think, too, that a lot of them, like, some things like that could be localized? Yeah, like, no, they could for be, sure. You know, I mean... Yeah, I mean, yeah. keep in mind, this is 19th century Argentine Spanish, which is right. going to be differing from continental European Spanish. Yeah. There was one line in this one where I translated as... He makes some remark, that's so I can eat, he said simply, in reference to making his, like, tinkering machines just so he can make money. But right. in Spanish, it is, eso es para comer, which is, like, that's to eat. And that, that doesn't really, like, make any sense, again, if translated literally. Say, I would have understood that. Yeah. I think. You know, so you can put food on your table. Yeah. Like, that's what people say in English, right? Yeah. Uh, that's for eating. I don't know. That That's to eat. Uh, I don't know. It, it kind of feels awkward. Yeah. I know what you mean. It's it's an unusual, strange way to put that yeah. in English. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> but I guess he is an eccentric occultist. Maybe uh, <laughs> that's how he talks. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Overall, I thought the translation was a, a fun, interesting process. And certainly, if you can read Spanish, I would definitely, especially recommend 
checking out Lugonis' stuff because he has a, a really cool pro style. So yeah, you, you appreciate his pro style. Oh yeah, I definitely do, yeah. How would you describe that? It seems more, I don't know, succinct and almost like poetic in a way that somebody like Holmberg, who was also difficult to translate, just seemed like more all over the place and like unfocused, I guess, and like obtuse, maybe not intentionally. I, I don't right. know. Yeah, I definitely got that impression from Holmberg. Maybe not so much the that one story with the automaton conspiracy, yeah. because that was just so far out yeah. and, and cool. That I didn't even occur to me, but Senor Knickknock, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think the other translations we have coming forward in future episodes are much easier authors to work with, so should be easier to get through on, on that front. I think you were still able to really capture that saying so little and, and so much, the conciseness of it, but still managing to convey a lot of meaning in it. Thank you. I hope the end product is readable enough to kind of get what he was going for with this. So certainly any feedback anybody has is most appreciated. Yeah. We want to get this stuff out there to as many people as possible. And I think this is stuff that's worth revisiting and worth having more people read it and know about it. Really seems like it's really underappreciated in the English speaking world. Yeah. So if any Spanish readers are paying attention and they want to read the English and perhaps also read Logoni's story and they might have some thoughts, obviously being kind, you might have certain opinions and we know how people like to express their opinions online sometimes nowadays, but <laughs> yeah, feel free to leave us some comments about all any of our translations, I guess. Yeah. They'd certainly most welcome because that's our ultimate goal is to get this stuff out there. Right. So that's Lugones, and I don't know if we'll be returning to him at any point. There's there's no other ones, right, that we had lined nope, up. Nope, I, I just translated yeah. those three. I'm probably not going right. to do any more. I think if we do return to him, it'll be that independent press translation that came out. There are other stories in Strange Forces that do sound science fiction-y that toe this weird line between the science and the spiritual. So, yeah, check them out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I liked it. All right. So I think next we're going to be returning to some familiar territory in Weird Tales. It's not a lot to say about Joel Nichols. His story, The Devil Ray, was published in 1926, and it was one of, I think, five stories that he published in Weird Tales magazine between 1925 and 1929. Joel Martin Nichols was born in 1895. He was an American, spent his early life in Connecticut, and ended up moving to Arizona with his wife later on. And apparently he did continue to write some fiction after 1929, but the teller of Weird Tales, which is a website that is dedicated to some of the writers of weird fiction and specifically weird tales that might not be quite as recognized and that might not have much information about them, it's kind of useful for people digging into this stuff, I guess. Only lists these stories. And there's also the bibliography at, oh, uh, I can't remember the name of the site. That the International Science Fiction Database? Yeah, I think that's the one, yeah. The ISFDB or yes. whatever it is? Yes, it only lists these stories in Weird Tales. Uh, and apparently he was working on a novel before the end of his life. But I'm guessing it was never finished. It seems that... Joel Martin Nichols devoted most of his career to advertising and was heavily involved with several major advertising firms in the 1930s and 40s. So really, again, with somebody who has so little output that we know about, there really isn't much to speculate about, except in this case, I think we can safely say that 
with this story, what you see is what you get. And there really isn't a lot of necessarily layers of things going on. But there's some things that I thought were of great interest. And as I said previously, I am somebody who is drawn to the beginning of things. And the first few chapters of this story really had me. And I mean, not to say that it turned out to be a poor story necessarily, but I guess in terms of, I don't know, it was more, it was perhaps more predictable in the end than I wanted it to be. Yeah. But the first few chapters were excellent, and he actually really did a good job of setting up atmosphere, and he did a really good job of adding this sense of weirdness with the protagonist that I'll get to as I summarize the story. So, three American thieves and criminals from urban streets, Ferris, Lefty, and the Spider, are somewhere remote in Austria after precious items to steal. And they hear a tale from a peasant about the neighboring villa and castle. A cow entered a field and died. The grass there is all dead. A devil flew overhead and poisoned everything. But Ferris, the scarred leader of the trio, knows better. It's really some kind of strange plane that comes from the castle. It's definitely artificial, but oddly quiet, too stealthy. We get a strange segue into Ferris's backstory, which is odd indeed. He became sinister four years before, when, in Chicago, after getting hit on the head by a mirror that was part of his door that was swung in his face by a thief trying to escape with his belongings, well, since then, he's hated the sight of mirrors, and he's also forgotten everything about who he was before. Will all this be relevant? Well, I'm not sure, but it's certainly kind of weird and cool. And <laughs> I just, I don't know, I was really taken by this weird concept, and I started to think about strange stories that are true about what happens to people that suffer brain injuries, where they do, in fact, have a complete personality change. And it's just such an eerie concept to think about. It was a direction that I didn't expect the story to go in. And it didn't really, <laughs> in the end. But it, it really took me by surprise. I'm like, whoa, that's really interesting. Yeah. And there's uh, another thing I noticed about this story. is There's a surprising amount of interiority about him. It's not just his perspective, but we get to see a lot of his thoughts like quite intimately. Which I thought was really interesting. And again... A touch that's not always necessary, and I think that if you want, maybe it could show in a way that even for a story like this, Weird Tales perhaps did have a little bit more of a literary aspiration than some of the contemporary pulps did, like Amazing, for instance. Yeah, I think we'll get to that in a couple episodes, but yeah. while I came into this expecting a typical pulpy Weird Tales story and got a pulpy weird tale story yeah i was not annoyed at the pros of this at all I, I thought he has a good style for this kind of thing yeah and again it makes me it makes me think like he could have done what if he had kept going with this <laughs> this writing mm -hmm. stories thing I, I guess maybe he did but i didn't find any i didn't find any evidence of those so where they've been published it would have been interesting to see what his book would have been like yeah it almost gets somewhere really awesome <laughs> So when Ferris recovers, there's one thing he never tells anyone. He has in his case that was recovered an envelope addressed to a Captain Lindley Fenshaw. And it has some meaningless numbers on it, but that's not really the point. The point is, the senior Fenshaw has been in the news. He was an x-ray scientist that disappeared under mysterious and possibly very foul circumstances. And it was believed that his son was on the lookout for him. The connection is pretty obvious already. George Ferris is Lindley Fenshaw, but unfortunately, because of his brain injury, he doesn't remember. So Ferris, meanwhile, became a sort of professional thief, and that's how he ended up in Austria. So he reprimands his two comrades for their temerity and willingness to listen to the ramblings of a half-baked peasant, as he puts it. He wants those Habsburg crown jewels, which are reputed to be worth a half million dollars or something. The question is, 
Are the jewels in the villa, as they have suspected? Or are they in the abandoned castle, where they can now see a light glimmering from a tower? Ferris is thinking, castle. And he wants to swim for it. The grounds, by the way, belong to this Baron Blennerhoff. And he has taken the jewels somewhere where they will be free from the prying Republicans. So, although this story is not political, I don't think, there's certainly a lot of reference to the contemporary times in 1925. So at this time, obviously, Germany had been somewhat beaten after the Great War. And indeed, there were thought to be certain treasures that the German members of the German nobility might be hiding somewhere. There's certainly a lot of reference to what happened in the preceding years. Nichols himself did see service, I think, I've read somewhere. So anyway, it's, it's kind of interesting that although this is nowhere near as politically motivated as Dorking, it's still very much set in its time. And in fact, the story is very specifically dated. So they want to put the prince back on the throne someday is the idea of the Blennerhoffs. And apparently the Viennese underworld has attempted to liberate these jewels on several occasions, but all met with failure. So now it's up to American pluck and daring do. Besides the Baron himself and a number of guards and servants, the grounds are home to a Colonel von Shang and a woman, supposedly the Baron's ward. Swimming in the lake to the castle, they see that the mysterious plane is birthed under the drawbridge, and it takes off as they approach. They find themselves under the structure with a ladder offering access to the castle, and Ferris finds cylindrical objects attached to the stonework. He concludes, They must be bombs! Are they going to be used later? Hmm. In the courtyard, they discover a brick structure of modern design. It's a garage of sorts, housing an impressive armored car. And it appears to be set up to deliver something from its turret that would normally contain a rifle or machine gun. Instead, it's a polished dome, maybe for emitting some kind of light. The castle itself appears to be a massive operation with work going on, and coal being shoveled, and dynamos running, and there's a strange machine with oscillating components that seems to generate a purple light. This is the Devil Ray. A haggard figure emerges from a hatch in the floor, and when Ferris catches a glimpse of him, he appears to go tense and then enter some kind of trance for a moment. And by the time Spider manages to shake him to his senses, the plane is almost on top of them, and they think they're safe in the lake. But the purplish ray is being emitted from the plane as it passes overhead. The ray is instant death to all life. It touches. And the spider is touched. And there's a strange description of death. But the thing that made the spider what he was. The thing which had made him different from the mud on the lake bottom. The thing which made him eat and drink and laugh and talk. That was gone forever. The fact that he put that in there is strange and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, what a strange way to describe somebody's dying. Like, I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that definitely <laughs> stuck out to me when I first read it. Yeah. And the scene itself is so cool, too. Like, you got this World War One mm -hmm. era. I don't know if it ever says if it's a biplane or, or what, but I was picturing it being a biplane, just like this big clunky mm -hmm. thing, just sweeping the ground with this vibrant purple ray it's just such a cool image yeah. yeah and it has this some kind of thing on the engines that makes them almost silent somehow yeah. which a clunky world war one biplane would certainly not have been right <laughs> and the way they describe it is just this, like throbbing in the air it's like you could feel it in your head almost yeah with the purple light passing overhead and yeah it's quite powerful <laughs> so lefty fritz his name by the way, the deceased's name is Spider Lang. I don't know that if that's just a coincidence or what, but that, that was kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, maybe those are their pseudonyms they take on when they're working crimes in the German territories. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but 
I just thought specifically Lefty Fritz and Spider Lang was yeah. odd. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Fritz Lang had made too many movies in 1925. He had actually. He made a few. I know. I don't know how uh, well they were seen in the United in, States internationally. Yeah. Yeah, but Der Nibelung. Yeah, that was oh. 1924. Ah. Der Nibelungen is incredible. Absolutely breathtaking. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's cool. I can imagine. I can imagine. He he definitely made some really creative films in the early 30s. So, and yeah. of course, Metropolis, right? So Yeah. Yep. And we're going to be covering the novel at some point on the podcast. Yeah. So that's, that's something to look forward mm -hmm. to, too. Yeah. That's going to be good. So yeah. anyway, after that diversion, <laughs> I just couldn't help but notice the names <laughs> and think, well, that's weird. Yeah. So Lefty had been waiting for them, and he says he's through. But Ferris opts just to stay behind for some reason. So Ferris returns to the village, and he learns nothing from his inquiries. So he decides to turn his attention to the villa again. Where are them jewels? One day, he's strolling down the mountain road, when he comes upon the Baron's ward and Colonel Von Shane. He seemed to have been arguing, and there's a strike, and she attempts to turn up the road, but her horse slips on the frosty ground and causes some falling rubble. It gets spooked, and Ferris saves her from falling off a cliff, and the horse falls to his death. <laughs> and the colonel is an arsehole to Ferris and seems about to shoot him, so the American just knocks him out. <laughs> and he's like, well, I had to do something. He was going for a gun. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it turns out the woman is also American. But she's never named throughout the story, so... No, and that's, like, the one thing that annoyed me the most <laughs> about this story. It's like, come on, you can't even give her, like, a <laughs> stupid a name. German name like you gave everybody else. Yeah, it's, like, the girl all yeah. the way through. Yeah, not even, like, Greta or anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess she wouldn't really be the Baroness, but we can call her the Baroness. How about that? So, she pines, she wishes he had killed the Colonel. And for some reason, Ferris' mind is suddenly full of hate. And he coldly promises, pushing the prostrate German off the cliff will result in instant death. But the girl won't have any of it. Excuse me, the Baroness won't have any of it. And Ferris just sees red and mutters to himself like a crazy person. It's weird, though, because she's the one who brought up the idea of killing him, but I guess... She was just musing because now she seems opposed to it because it's not sporting. <laughs> yeah, <a> weird <laughs> line of argument. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some weird character stuff in here with for her especially. Um, yeah. So she threatens him with a gun and tells him to leave because she's going to take the colonel's side when he wakes up. And chapter five of the story just consists of Ferris in his room feeling nervous and attuned to the atmosphere of everything as there's a thunderstorm outside. It's pretty neat. But then he gathers together some stuff and drops out of the window close to midnight, heading into the hills. Looks like after everything, he's still after the jewels at this point. Fascinated by the castle as ever, Ferris goes for the villa this time instead. And entering a dining room window, our man quickly finds the safe in a drawing room. He's not doing so well, though. He's making a lot of noise and losing his gun. Still, we got some loving description of safe cracking, which I also thought was cool. And then the Baroness walks in and snaps a light on. And he springs to his feet and finds himself gazing into his reflection. He looks awful. The eyes seem to engulf him as there's a flash of lightning. And he falls over and has a fit. And the Baroness is maternal. He doesn't remember where he is or recognize her. Lindley is back. Total recall. In an odd turn, she thinks he might be fading at first. But now Joel says another weird thing. He says, what needed fading? She was a woman, helpless. He was a man, powerful. He really doesn't seem very powerful at this moment. So... I guess, I, 
I don't know. I guess he's just saying that she's a victim of her maternal instinct, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> she understands a little, but we know not what she's talking about. So she says she understands. Or, I don't know. So anyway, the jewels have been gone for weeks, and he doesn't really remember the last four years. So she dates the story's telling to October 1926. And he's fretting about his father. Nevertheless, he starts to remember most recent events, including the death of the spider, which horrifies her. She's the Baron's niece, or something. An American by birth, she's automatic kinship to him somehow. Of course. Uh, as far as she's concerned, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really get that, because... Hello, countrymen. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, both her parents were killed fighting for Austria, I think. So, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's weird. I didn't understand. <laughs> her, well, her mother was a nurse or something. And... Yeah, her mother was a, a nurse and her father went to, even though he was in, in America, he went to Austria to fight on their side. Yeah. Then Von Sheng approaches and Linley hides behind a hanging as Von Sheng rants about German victory and how this time they shall not be so lenient. And the Baron is on his way to the Royal Highness with the Leipish Ray, the Light of Vengeance, the Purple Death. The uprising of the monarchies of the Triple Alliance has begun. Within a week, America will be at our feet. And they'll stop on the way to take Paris and London in time for tea. The name of the American prisoner, Fenshaw, is invoked. He helped them. The foolish Americans will thank him for their destruction. I'm sorry, I'm having too much fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the evil colonel is lusting after the poor baroness. And Lindley crashes out from behind the hangings. And the men square off. And Vong Sheng grabs a sword off the wall. But the Baroness gives Lindley an identical one from the library, and Von Sheng sneers about the green American. Ah! But not so green. He does not know that he faces Lindley Fenshaw, captain of the fencing team. It's a test of endurance, and they're equally matched. The girl, a thoroughbred, doesn't shy away from the battle, but helpfully drags the rug out of the way, because Lindley was tripping on it. And he thinks about his father and how he must have contributed to the Devil Ray, which the Germans now have. Hopefully it was coercion of some kind and not betrayal. Now, Von Sheng thinks he can plunge the room into darkness and escape through the window. But in the darkness, Lindley uses his sword like a rapier and skewers Von Sheng, well done. The Colonel mutters death words of defiance. They are too late. Ah, but Lindley must rescue father. He doesn't remember where the castle is. She must help him. She's never been in the castle. Some bullshit about the walls being weak and dangerous. The castle is open now and pretty much undefended. Nevertheless, he thinks there must be guards somewhere and tries to send her back. But she's brave and says no. The powerhouse is abandoned, but they climb up and up to the tower. And on the seventh landing, there is a room from which he can hear breathing. Two sleeping men. One is his father. The other is an evil German guard. And that is chained up. Thank God he's not a traitor. Lindley and the German fight, and the German, knowing they've been caught out somehow, reaches a switch that primes the bombs. They will detonate in 18 minutes. Takes a while. They aren't able to defuse the bombs, but Lindley rips three of them away, and they go to the plane, and they aim to follow the armored car and catch up with them. So they might not be too late. And the Baroness insists that she come, because she too is an American, and her mother died for America. 
Do they succeed? Ah, of course they do. And they make it up from the castle just in time and fly for a bit on what looks like a suicide mission. But on the third try, the car is destroyed and they land peacefully by a lake. The professor and son have a talk. The former had met Leipish at school and was kidnapped. And they now find the two men dead by the wreckage of the car. That is, Leipish and the Baron. Both characters whom we never actually met in the story. I would have liked to at least seen the Baron in action. Yeah. I guess one of my main complaints about yes. this story was, even though the... The whole thing with Ferris was pretty cool and interesting. I wanted to see more of the antagonists because they were fun. And there was only really the colonel and the sword fight. And that was kind of the climax. <laughs> and after that, it's kind of just like throwing bombs at invisible people. Right? Which is never that satisfying of a... I don't know. It's just kind of unsatisfying. Like, I'm kind of reminded of that really long Patrick Trout and Doctor Who story, The Invasion. Where uh, it's yeah. like, the first seven episodes are all like... Tobias Vaughn and the menace of the Cybermen and it's all like really pretty cool and then there's a whole episode of them like just sitting in rooms trying to destroy like the rockets in space and it's like most of that episode the final episode is like it makes you feel that that feeling of oh yeah space travel is going to be really slow and like there's going to be a lot of sitting around waiting for things to happen <laughs> so anyway <laughs> There really doesn't seem to be much love lost between Baron and Ward. And it seems that he promised her to the vicious Von Shang, after all, which is kind of something that was very, very briefly mentioned at one point by the Colonel. Like, it kind of showed his, uh, Joel kind of showed his thought process for a moment, and it seemed like that had been a thing. So his he thought his lust was justified, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah the, that whole thing is weird but hey, there you go the germans are evil so yeah right <laughs> <laughs> professor fenshaw does express sorrow over Leipish. they had been working on a cure for cancer electrotherapeutics x-ray and Leipish independent research went from that to a death ray that destroyed blood vessels in the brain instantly and kills all plant life and even stops motors and things from operating. So with that conversation and the reunion of father and son, son thinks about the Baroness, who is apparently waiting for him at this nice cottage they just stopped at, I guess. I don't know if it belongs to somebody or not. But they're Americans, and they know what they're doing. So, yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> the devil ray. <laughs> <laughs> This is it was fun. I liked it. I had a good time with it. As as you can probably tell. It did have its yeah, it had its weird turns that didn't really lead too much. Like I think a really interesting thing about reading stories like this sometimes is the story underneath the story that doesn't get told. Right. You know, and there's like at least three or four different ones in this story. Like there's the meeting of Leipish and Professor Fenshaw, and there's the story of the girl and how she ended up in the care of this baron and there's the story of ferris and how he spent four years as a professional safe cracker and like in a whole new life you know all these things are they're not really what the story is concerned with it's concerned with getting it back on the germans and stopping the purple ray i guess which surprisingly they don't claim for america so i think if, if it had gone that way Martin, perhaps Joel couldn't have helped but take it in a satirical direction like Fortune, and he just didn't want to do that. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, this was definitely cool. I mean, silly, but a lot of fun. And sometimes yeah. a work doesn't have to be deep or revolutionary to be a good time, and this was definitely an enjoyable one. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I liked the prose, and I thought there were some fun moments in it. So, yeah, even though it did feel a bit generic at the end of it, I, I, I still thought that overall was a good read. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, too, that here we are again with the Germans as the antagonist. Like, we spent well, yeah. a little time with mm -hmm. the French, right? And now it's back to the Germans. <laughs> We've come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a funny thing, though, is, too, that it kind of sets a precedent of the Germans as being portrayed as kind of 
funny and, and like goofily belligerent almost and we, we saw a little bit of this in war in the air by wells as well although like he kind of punctured it you know and he had like this the german lieutenant who was kind of like sympathetic and really started to feel like this war was screwing them all over and it wasn't very good yeah. like you know he started out as a complete patriot and then he kind of went so you know wells was a little bit he, he tried to be a bit nuanced about it but there there does seem to be this thing mm-hmm. that started I mean, you can even even though it's a little more sober and a lot less like kind of intended for fun entertainment, like there's a little bit of an endorking when the narrator wakes up and he's in a room and he's like, "There's a bunch of Germans in the house and they're talking to each other." Yeah. I didn't really go over this when I was summarizing it, but like the Germans are basically talking about the English soldiers and they're like talking about the volunteers. Mm-hmm. And, in German too, and in, yeah, not translated in, in English. Yeah, it's and it's not a very interesting conversation. But the point is, like the whole time they're doing it, they're like eating with her silverware, and they've got their feet on her table, and it's just like they're so slovenly and dirty, and they're like, and it's, it says, "Oh, this German was probably using a fork for the first time, right?" And it's like, and there's a bit yeah. of this, and the funny thing is too, like even after the Second World War, you started to see, you were still seeing that, but now. Now it's not so much the case, and I think it, a lot of it's like people kind of saw what the results of the Holocaust were, and it was kind of like it started to be uncomfortable. It started to be like, yeah, it's not, it's not funny anymore, kind of. Yeah, the, you do have Nazi villains into films. I mean, pretty much till the present day. I I don't really keep up on modern movies, yeah. but no, they're villains, but they're not like they're not caricatures. Like they're not. Yeah. Ah, 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 these foolish Americans will not stop us now. You know, it's like, yeah. this is, I, I had a lot of fun with that German colonel's dialogue in the story. Yeah, you know? right. It was just so, it was so yeah. like that Man From Uncle episode about bringing Hitler back. Like, it was just, <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like that kind of reached a peak with those <laughs> Nazi exploitation films in the 1970s. And then mm. once it couldn't go any further, it started to kind of recede, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, enough's enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess there are all later instances in popular culture, the character on the Simpsons, I forget his name, the German kid. Can't help you actually. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, I think it's still there to some degree. Cool. Yeah. I'll have to look. I, I don't, I guess I'm showing my lack of culture here, but I haven't watched enough of the Simpsons to actually know who the German kid is. <laughs> yeah. So. I have not seen the Simpsons either. So I, I'm, I, I perhaps uh, that's something I should look into. Yeah. I mean, it was such a popular show when I was, a teenager right but mm. between between a certain age but i just yeah like i would catch it when it was on and sometimes when i got what was happening i was sort of amused by it right but yeah this is it still on oh yeah yeah it's on like season uh, 30 something now holy crap so still being made wow yeah interesting mm. yeah the crazy yeah. world <laughs> yeah yeah that was definitely like that's the most pulpy that we've gotten tonight for sure oh yeah Um, definitely we've got an interesting gamut of stories i think if i was pressed to make a top 10 list again i don't know that any of these stories would really make that but they're all pretty interesting in their own right (laughs) and i did have a good time with these yeah dorking was was the heaviest for sure yeah i think in comparison all the others are much lighter than dorking Uh, certainly Mm -hmm. lugonas can be dense at times but it's also like a five-page story so it yeah. doesn't really yeah. get as like thick as dorking does i mean there's the suicidal implication at the end which isn't obvious but yeah it's there right but, yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah no definitely a good set this time i did want to mention about devil ray is that this was published in three parts in weird yes. Man. the last part yeah. of it was published in the same issue that had a uh, runaway world by claire winger harris which we covered last month and yeah, i just right. thought that was really interesting yeah. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. actually might be where I found the story initially. I don't remember when I marked oh. this down, but I think I was looking for the text of Runaway World, and I saw the Devil Ray in the Table contest. It's like, oh, that looks interesting. Mm. Yeah, it was a good choice then, because three of the four stories that we did tonight involve mysterious forces of death or paralysis. Yeah. Right? So it's a yeah. good match. And I, I guess they don't really play it up that much in Dorking, but they do have a future fantasy mysterious weapon that 
disables the British Navy. And yeah. we don't know. It could be a ray. It could be mines. Mm -hmm. It could be something else. Yeah, I think in the story they're called fatal engines or something like that. Yeah. That could mean anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vague. It's like, don't forget, too, the idea of an engine at that time wasn't necessarily what it is today. Like, it could just be right. something that operates on something else, right? Like, it's not necessarily, I don't know, mm -hmm. like, somebody could say something like a war engine, right? And it's not necessarily a big engine. <laughs> like, today yeah. we take it that literally. <laughs> but, yeah, it's kind of interesting that this one was serialized in three parts in weird tales it's not that long no it, it, it isn't that long and there was actually yeah. uh, a, an obvious typo i think when they skipped from the second installment to the third installment they screwed up the chapter numbering yeah they oh i noticed that yeah, yeah. They, there were two chapter fives yeah yeah yes. yeah and it was weird too because the one chapter five was like the first one was the really short one that had it was just him in his room like yeah. feeling weird and it was like a, the only chapter that's I mean, I could say that it's a space filler, but I kind of, like, I like that it was there because it added a little bit of extra texture to the story, right? Yeah. But nothing happened. Like, at the end of the chapter, he went out mm -hmm. through the window, but other than that, it was just him in his room feeling really strange, which you would expect from a character that essentially lost his mind and changed personalities and was having, like, semi-flashbacks, right? Yeah. So, again, it's, like, some cool thing about this story that the summary kind of belies, you know, like, especially towards the end, like, there's not really anything great about the last, I'd say from, from the point where they rescued dad till the ending of the story. Like, it's, it's kind of like a little bit, all the, the cool atmospheric elements kind of go away a little bit. Yeah. Although the trying to get away and to blast the car at the end does have a certain amount of tension in the way that it's written, though. So, Yeah. But that's about all I have to say about The Devil Ray and trying to compare it with all the other stories that we've read tonight, which I think is an interesting batch that sort of formed semi-accidentally, like wasn't really necessarily known because none of us had read any of these before we actually started. But they all tend to, they relate in interesting ways, I think. So I think we all got something out of these. And Nate, why don't you tell us what we're doing next time? Sure. So next time we're going to be continuing to explore themes of war and military applications, but in particular, international espionage. So we're going to be looking at precursors to what developed as spy-fi or early spy and espionage fiction and taking a look at some works that kind of go in the hopper for influencing James Bond and the direction that the genre would take past that. So next time we are going to be looking at a novel and two short stories. The two short stories being from Arthur Morrison in The Case of the Dixon Torpedo from 1894. We are going to be looking at German author Karl Gruner, short story The Martian Spy from 1908 and Helen McGinnis's 1941 novel, Above Suspicion. So I think it's going to be a couple of interesting stories that follow up on some of the themes from tonight, but probably in a different fashion. So those will be pretty cool to dig into. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Especially intrigued by the longer work and what it might entail, actually. Yeah, I am too. Mm -hmm. um, so we hope you can visit us next time. All right, until next time, make sure you keep your armies well prepared for the coming great invasions. But if you're sitting at the dinner table, keep your death rays well covered so you don't accidentally eliminate your dinner guests. With that being said, good night. Until next time, we are the Chrononauts.